A lot of times people pretend like um, a good loss rate is success, and that to me is not necessarily success. You can have the best loss rate in the world, and you aren't having fun, and that's not success to me. If you're, if you're enjoying what you're doing, that's success, no matter what your loss rate, no matter what else you're doing. Yeah? Uh, I heard a guy say one time, why is it that beekeeping is the only hobby that people break that they have to make money or at least break even for it to be a good hobby? Yep. You go play golf, play 75 bucks, come home, and have nothing to show for it but a scorecard. Yep. Or they get into, <laughs> you know, uh, scrapbooking and they buy all this paper and they have a nice book look at it, but they spend all that money. But at beekeeping, we feel like, man, I got to break even somehow yep. or I'm done. And I think that comes from the commercial beekeeping mindset because commercial beekeeping is about making money. It's not about bees, it's not about anything but making money, that's business. And I'm not faulting them for that, but you guys aren't commercial beekeepers and so there's no reason for you to think like that or keep bees like that. Just be what you are and have fun doing what you do. You don't have to fit anybody else's definition of success. All right, so the, the basic walk away split if anybody's not familiar how to do this you're going to take your hive you're going to open it up you're going to put a new bottom board and a new box next to it or maybe you'll once you've done you'll take it somewhere else so that uh two miles away so that you don't have drift back and forth and you're going to take half of the brood leave it in the first box and put the other half in the other box. You don't necessarily have to find the queen. All right, it will become obvious pretty quickly where the queen ended up. Because the, the, if you've got two hives made out of one that are sitting right next to each other, generally the one with the most bees in it after a couple days will be the one that had the queen in it. Okay, but if not, if you take, if you take the one, if you take them, move them apart, they won't be able to intermix and, and um, the, the home bees will come back to the original hive and then whatever ones were in the hive when you moved it will be with that one. Uh, what what will happen is that the um, hive will make, the, the one that doesn't have the queen will take young brood and make about a dozen-ish new queens and will make a new hive for you. The problem with that is it's kind of inefficient. Now, for your purposes, if you just want to do a simple split, it doesn't really matter how efficient it is. You're going to end up with two hives in the end. But you're going to end, you're going to you're pretty much going to ruin your honey production for both hives at that point, and you're losing the opportunity to make a bunch more splits with the queens that are killed by the first queen that hatches out. Everybody knows that the first queen that hatches out kills the rest of them, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a selection, uh, it's a natural selection toward rapidly developing queens. Um, so this is an example of something that I found uh, after I did a bunch of walkaway splits. This was the year that I decided that I was going to learn how to graft because um, I went out to the splits and I found all of these dead virgin queens laying on the ground in front of the hives. Normally bees would like to carry dead bees out and fly away with them and drop them somewhere, but because queens are so big, uh, a worker bee usually can't carry one. So they ended up right on the front, front step of the hive. These are really dumb names I put on these. <laughs> Uh, so this is what happens when you, when you discover a hive that's in the middle of superseding. You might think it's a, a swarm cell, but it's usually swarm cells will be on the bottom edges of the comb, and supersede your cells will be in the middle of the comb, somewhere in the middle. So anytime you find a hive that's got cells in it, you can, at the minimum, you can take the hive and split it up several ways, giving each split a queen cell or a frame that has a queen cell on it. Could be multiple queen cells, that's fine. Um, if you need to and you want to separate them up, you can take a small, like a pen knife or small sharp knife and cut a good circle around the queen cell if it's in the middle of the comb. If you have plastic frames, it's not going to work. But 
If you have wax frames, you can usually avoid a wax foundation or no foundation. You can, or you can usually avoid wires if you have wired frames. If you don't have wired frames, you just have foundationless and you can cut out whatever you need. So you can, you can make multiple splits out of one hive. And the same thing you can do if you are finding a hive that is in the middle of swarming. Or you can cause the swarming to happen yourself. So in this case, what we're looking at is a hive that has come through winter well, and you're not going to put a super on the hive. You're going to kind of intentionally crowd them, so they're going to want to swarm. You're going to keep an eye on that so that when they start to make swarm cells before the old queen leaves, you can get her, put her in a new hive by herself with, with a frame or two of brood, and then take each one of those frames of swarm cells and make more splits, more nukes, nucleus hives. Um, this one can be, if you don't keep an eye on it, it can happen while you're not paying attention. You might come on a hive that is, has already swarmed and so the queen and a lot of the workers have left and so you've lost a lot of that worker population. So your, your splits are gonna be a little less strong. Um, and again, you can, you can cut the cells out of the frames to uh, make more nukes, or you can just leave the ones on the frames. It depends on how many you want to make out of one hive. So, yeah. If, if you were, to, to, to combine the thinking, if you were to start with a walk away split, and they're going to then have to go through some procedure to raise up a queen, are they going to most likely then create multiple queen cells? And then could you then take that and use that to create? Three or four out of that one then? Yes. And that's what I'm, the next slide. Okay. Yeah, what you can do that is uh, you make a hive queenless, or you make a split like that. In that case, I would recommend taking the queen and putting her with a fewer number of frames of brood, so you're leaving more brood to make the new splits with. And then when they start making queen cells, you go back in a couple days later, divide that up again. Um, I like to use, um, I use what's called queen castles. You can buy these from, I know at least Brushy Mountain sells them, probably Man Lake sells them. What a queen castle is, it's a normal size box, but it's got dividers in it. Typically they'll sell a deep box, will have three dividers in it to make four two frame nukes, okay? And so when you, when you take those one or two frames of brood and put them in their own box, in their own hive with a, with a queen cell, with them, you will be able to have the same heat dynamics as a full hive and so you can, um, they'll, they'll keep each other warm rather than having a single box or a single frame in a, in a box by itself somewhere which isn't going to be very good at heat regulation. And early in the spring, especially when it's still cold at night, heat regulation is going to be very important. So you don't want to you don't want to try and, and start a, a, a nuke with one frame of brood in a big empty box by itself. It probably won't work. It might work. It might not be healthy. Um, so pay attention to that. When, when you say when queen cells are ready, are you letting them form and then a few more days after that to start to? Yes. Uh, it's something I haven't mentioned, I guess. <coughs> Um, queen cells have a very specific length of time it takes for them to develop. So it starts when the egg is laid, usually about four days later, depending on temperature, the egg hatches into a tiny larva. Um, if that larva develops into a queen, it'll happen within 14 days. So the best time, with, with a lot of these methods, once that queen cell has started to form, even if it hasn't been capped yet, you can, you can split things apart and do things with it, and they will continue to feed that queen cell and it will become a full queen cell. And you don't have to worry about the timing. Um, with, there's actually on my website, parkerbees.com, I have a, an Excel spreadsheet that you can download, and you can put in the day that you um, graft, the equivalent day if you were grafting, and it will tell you from where, and you can, you can learn to identify uh, 
a grafting aged larva. It's, it's still at a, in a C shape in the bottom of the cell before it fills up the bottom of the cell and starts to stretch out. Um, and so you, you kind of assume that that's the day when that happens, that, that the bees start turning that into a queen. And then from there you can tell approximately the day that the queen will hatch out, and so you want to do it before that. And there's also a time in there where you prefer not to jiggle them around too much. But generally, if, if, it's, if there's a queen cell formed with these types of things, you can split it out and not have a problem to worry about the timing. So I wanted to yeah. there a, um, selective advantage to moving more than one queen cell? In other words, if you just move one queen cell and she's a dud, uh, for whatever reason, would it be safer to have multiple queen cells to sort of compete for dominance? Technically, there is a selective disadvantage to putting one queen cell per nuke because there's no selection pressure for emergence speed. That's what I was getting. Right? Um, which long term, we don't want to mess with too much, but that will usually correct itself the first time a supersedure happens. Um, so I don't worry about that too much. I'm going for the most efficient way to to make the maximum number of hives because when you're starting when you when you have a, a backyard beekeeper that's got one or two hives and wants to expand up quickly you don't want to waste queens so yeah you, that's exactly right okay. no, it um, depends on your short-term goals so I'm trying to distinguish between swarm cells and super senior cells I guess the, the distinction <coughs> is that the super senior cell does not culminate in swarming Correct. Okay. A supersedure cell is there to replace a queen who is either failed or is in the process of failing. Okay. And I so, realize that the diff location of the frame, you can determine that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because, and a lot of times people get into trouble because they think that's a swarm cell, and so they'll want to get rid of it because they don't want their hive to swarm. And what they're doing is they're killing off their replacement queen and maybe their queen is already dead or maybe she's about to to quit laying yeah, we and about that one of our recent meetings. yeah and the bees know but you don't know so yep. i recommend not not messing with those and finally one, one final question um could you just define the word graft a little more explicitly yeah um grafting is the process by which you scoop a young larva usually within 24 hours of emerging out of or well they don't emerge out of the egg they kind of dissolve the egg and become a larva if you've if you've ever seen a, a video of it like there's an egg and then it kind of lays over and it becomes a larva it's they don't like hatch out of an egg like a chicken does um, so when they when they begin to be a larva when they dissolve the egg coating and become a larva within 24 hours You'll scoop that larva out of there, and actually, after you want to do it between 12 to 24 hours, not zero to 24 hours, but 12 to 24 hours. So the larva's grown a little bit, still being fed royal jelly, and so you scoop the larva out of the cell, and you out of a out of a worker cell. Yeah, and then you place the larva in a queen cup, which you can either buy or make yourself. And then the way you manipulate the hive to produce the queen is by either, in the, in the commercial case, you're doing it queenless. So the, the hive that's making the queens is be making the queens because they need a queen. The way I do it that I'll explain here in a minute is they're making a queen because they assume there's a supersedure going on. Uh, anything I need to clarify, words, the supersedure is when a, a hive naturally replaces its own queen. Everybody knows that, right? Okay. Um, any other words that I need to define before we go on? Okay. So the way that commercial beekeepers do it is they will create a queenless cell builder nuke. And th what they'll do is they'll shake a lot of um, a lot of nurse bees into a, a a nuke with with open brood. So we want bees that are still in the phase of their life where they're making royal jelly. Because to make queens, we need a lot of a good supply of royal jelly to feed the larva, so it becomes a queen rather than a worker. And so what they'll do is they'll graft a bunch of 
queen cups, which are uh, a cup made of, a lot of times people use plastic. It's, it's about 3 8 inch in diameter, about 3 8 inch deep with a cup shape in the bottom. And they'll put the larva in there and they'll put it in so that the cup is facing down in this queenless hive with all these nurse bees. And because they have no queen and they have all these queen cups, they build them into queens by feeding them royal jelly and extending that cup down to make a queen cell, which is kind of looks like a peanut, sort of. Um, then typically once they've started maybe 100, 150 of these queen cups, they will move them to a queen right hive, which is a good, has a good population, above a queen excluder so that those bees can finish the queen cells into full queens and once they're capped they'll be moved to uh, mating nukes. The mating nukes that commercial beekeepers use are typically a little thing made out of um, it's a tiny little hive, sometimes very tiny, made out of styrofoam because it's cheap and easy to make them with um, some little top bars in it and a little feeder and they dump a couple, one or two cups of bees in there with a, with a queen cell and the, the, the bees will incubate the queen cell, she'll hatch out, she'll go out and mate, she'll come back, she'll start laying eggs in the, in the comb that they've built in there. And so what they do when they, it makes it really quick and easy for, for commercial operations to make queens because they can take the queen out, cage her, and ship her out, and at the same time replace her with another, would replace that with another queen cell, which then ha hatches and the process repeats. If you don't have your timing down on that really well, that little hive, because it's got so little space, is going to want to swarm all the time because there's no space. You know, a queen can lay uh, eggs in a in a mating nuke, a mini mating nuke. She can fill that whole thing with eggs in a day. So if they don't, if they're not in there getting it out and, and done she'll swarm out and you'll lose that queen. Any questions on the commercial method? Yeah? Well, how do they, do they create their own drone congregation area? A lot of times commercial beekeepers will put uh, drone comb in hives to create more drones in their area to flood their area, their, or at least where they're mating their queens so that they're hopefully getting their own drones there. Otherwise, with that volume of queens being mated all the time, you'll run low on drones pretty quick. Because the, the traditional idea is that a queen will mate with 12 to 20 drones. However, people are finding out with, uh, with new methods of, of testing with cameras and, and you've probably seen the video of they put a, put a camera with a queen, fly her around a little bit and, and watch the magic happen. and they've discovered that the queen might mate with as many as 50 drones now and of course every time she mates with a drone the drone dies so you need to replenish that for yourself i would recommend um, not worrying about having excess drone brood the the bees will make as many drones as they want and need and the more of your drones that you have in your area the better chance that you're going to affect your area, your surrounding area with your drones, your treatment free drones. So I, I try in my area to outcompete the, uh, the local commercial guy because I know he's trying to get rid of drones because that's less efficient for him because every drone costs, you know, maybe twice in resources to make a drone than it does to make a worker. And so he's, he wants the bees to make the honey and do all the stuff, and drones don't help. Whereas me, a lot of my goal is to outbreed his bees so I don't have to worry about the effects. And so I want more drones and I'm not quite as concerned about honey because breeding is more fun than collecting honey a lot of times. The reason I ask is um, at the last Chester County meeting, one of the benefits of uh, the membership was having access to their club yard mm -hmm. and doing splits you can place your nuke down there for, for, for mating the queen. Um, because you know they, they know several different uh, keepers close by you know it has a good uh, amount of drones which makes me wonder okay if I just do a split where I'm at if there's many beekeepers around is that going to create a problem with the queen mating 
It's very rare that you'll have a problem with a queen mating. There's um, the places that I've heard that sometimes have problems are areas where there's no um, landmarks, where the, the, the drones don't form congregation areas around a landmark or along a fence row or a field or, you know. They like to have landmarks so they can congregate in certain areas and the queen will fly through and a bunch of them will go follow her. And, um, so I've heard of that happening, but as far as actually not having any drones around to mate with, that's usually not a problem. Especially here, there's there's lots of bees in this area. Just lots of beekeepers. Just out of curiosity, are, is there, are there characteristics of those landmarks you just spoke of that where we could go out and find a likely drone landmark? Um, there are. I, I'm not necessarily able to tell you where that is. Yeah, and they call them drone comets because there'll, there'll be a, a queen flying along and you'll see a bunch of, of drones falling. I've personally never seen one, but I'm told they exist and it'd be interesting to see. But yeah, the queen can... Dave Tarpey. Say again? We had a meeting with Dave Tarpey and he flew over and tried to find a drone congregation area. What he told us was that they follow tree lines and intersections where fields they're usually in the corner and they're always about top of tree height. Uh, you'll find them. And once you find one, they'll, they'll be there for a long, long time. <coughs> so what was the balloon about? We hung a queen cage underneath the balloon and flew oh. around to see if we could. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. If you want to have a little experiment. I should try that. That sounds interesting. We have a video that we shot of it. We did it in a peaky cool. Put a queen in a drone, in a, in a queen cage, and fly around on a balloon. <laughs> Man. Trolling. 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 <laughs> Sounds good to me. Man, I always, I always lament the fact that I'll never come up with something like the, uh, the flow hive or some other little gadgets that I've seen because I'm just not a gadget person like that. I, you know, I'm, I'm cheap. I do what I need to do and I don't mess around with other ideas. So I'll never come up with something like the flow hive. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, talking about drones. Go ahead. Tom, have you noticed a difference, uh, and maybe you don't even do it, but whenever you go from a, um, uh, you know, your, your, your starter little nuke to start your queens in, to move it to a finishing hive. Um, I know last year I did it for the first time and I was like blown away by how much extra rural jelly ended up in those queen cells. And everyone's like, well, you know, sure that will make a better queen. I, I don't know. Do you think there's much to that? Uh, as far as the amount of royal jelly that ends up in the queen cell, she will only eat a certain amount. Okay. She'll grow to a certain size, she'll only eat a certain amount. A lot of times you'll see in a hatched queen cell, you'll see a little chunk of, kind of looks like butter, because it's gotten a little old, but she doesn't always eat all of it. Oh. It's actually good that you see extra in there because then you know that she got a full load. So that's, that's good. But she doesn't always eat all of it. Uh, if she doesn't have enough, she might end up smaller, she might end up less well developed, um, less fewer ovaries, fewer ovarials. You can look up what those things are. Um, just suffice it to say, if she doesn't get well fed, she won't be a good quality queen. She won't have a, as high a capacity and able to, to lay as many eggs. So this is again talking about drones. Um, people that do foundationless, who in here does foundationless? Good number, okay. Um, from my experience doing polls in, the, in my Facebook group, about 75% of treatment-free beekeepers use foundationless at least part-time. I use it personally for drone frames, like if you, don't, um, if you want to produce extra drones, you want to, to flood your area with drones, you don't necessarily have to buy drone comb or drone frames. Just use a foundationless frame, put it in the hive, toward the end of, uh, like, don't put it right in the middle of the, the brood nest, right in the middle of the best nectar flow, because they'll probably make brood comb out of it. But if you put it in there at an off time, they'll make drone comb out of it, and then you'll have a free drone frame. Solomon, yeah. 
jumping ahead, but for foundationless, if you want to do small cell, don't you have to do foundationless? Or I guess now they might be making some foundation small cell, but. I make a, and this is a, a whole talk that I can do maybe if we have time at the end, but on the subject of small cell, I make the distinction of small cell as being specifically 4.9 millimeter. Foundationless is a variation in cell size. So you have a number of different cell sizes. It's not a specific, it's not specifically small cell. Small cell is more like a, a threshold rather than a, um, what am I trying to say? Anyway, uh, small cell is specifically 4.9 millimeter. Foundationless, you get all kinds of different cell size. Yeah, from brood comb all the way up to drone comb and honeycomb. So uh, if you want to do foundationless, I don't have any, I, I encourage it. Uh, if you want to do small cell, I do small cell because I want foundation, because I want to be able to set up a hive and leave it and not have to worry about coming back and straightening the combs and whatnot. Uh, just to, again, laziness, I mean efficiency on my part. <laughs> And I think I saw man, at least in our area, Man Lake now sells the, the small cell foundation. I don't know who else does. But. Yes, Man Lake, Dayton, and Brushy Mountain all sell, sm all sell small cell foundation in wax. Uh, yeah, exactly, seashells. Um, Man, Man Lake also now sells vertical wired small cell foundation. I don't know who else does. Man Lake also sells. You can tell where I buy most of my stuff. Man Lake also sells plastic, full plastic frames that have uh, small cell embossed plastic foundation on them. So those are actually, if you want to regress rapidly onto small cell, those plastic frames work really well because the bees can't change the base size. With uh, small cell foundation wax, they you can't force them with wax. They'll they'll still kind of they'll get there, but they're just gonna do whatever they want first. Oh, can you tell people why people want to use small cell? <coughs> For those of you that don't know, the 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 theories on small cell were developed by D. Lusby back in the mid '80s, in with the idea that smaller bees would. Well, let's go back a little further. It was developed because D. Lesby discovered that the original cell size, the original natural cell size of the bees was smaller than what it is currently available in foundation. She attributes that to a purposeful reduction in, or increase in cell size over the years for various purposes. Uh, from what I've looked at and if you, the way that different foundation manufacturers produced foundation at different dates I don't see reason to believe that it was done on purpose. I think most of what happened is somebody made foundation at this size, somebody else went out of business, new business started, they did it at this size, and it just kind of got bigger randomly over time. Um, there are different, different manufacturers came into business, made foundation at certain sizes, and went out of business, and so the ones that remained in business were the ones that tended tended to be the ones that made the larger cell size, and it just kind of happened that way over the last hundred years. Anyway, um, her theory was that larger cells make larger bees, which have larger breathing tubes, and so when the tracheal mites came along, they could get in more easily, and so if you returned the bees down to a smaller cell size, smaller bee, you have less problem with tracheal mites. So she wanted to return the bees more to a natural size. Uh, 4.9 millimeter was the size she chose at which she felt that the problems seemed to be solved. Uh, when Varroa came along, that theory was extended to include some effects on Varroa mites. And the theory behind that is by, remain, by keeping the worker bees smaller, you are pushing more of the mite load onto the drones. And drones are more or less expendable. So a hive can withstand a larger mite load and survive and get to the other processes of, of selection um, to where we can get some treatment-free bees. So there have been a couple of scientific studies done on small cell and have shown that small cell does not reduce the number of mites in the hive.
So that's important to remember. It's not like small cell isn't a treatment. It's not going to kill mites for you. Um, I use it because, number one, I want foundation because less maintenance. And number two, if you're going to use foundation, why not use the more natural size just because, at least, yeah. Another advantage with small cell is it allows more cells per frame. That's true. The queen can, in essence, lay more eggs on one single frame without spreading out the nest. True. Smaller cells means more cells in a certain area, tighter brood nest, other things. Yeah. Small cells are supposed to also be, first off, commercial beekeepers wanted bigger bees because they thought broods were better, fly farther, do whatever. And small cells were supposedly smaller bees take less time to develop, which means less cycles for mites to be able to develop profounders in the cell, and it's supposed to have an impact on varroa. Correct. However, the studies don't show that it's reducing varroa numbers, so I'm not sure how effective that is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm only, I don't want to, to, to spread ideas that I can't really back up, so that's why I don't mention that specific one. Yeah. So since, since we're on drones with that, on, on the small cells, they'll still naturally draw out all the drones they need, either bottom top or they'll just expand enough cells, even though they have a small cell foundation, or do you leave some frames in there for drone production then? In my experience on small cell, the bees will, for the most part, still do whatever they want. In fact, they will probably make more drones on small cell foundation than they will on conventional size, which is typically 5.2 to 5.5 millimeters. With, with the 5.2 to 5.5, they seem to draw that more consistently. They don't seem like they have more control over, over cell size. On small cell, you can eventually re re regress them down to 4.9 millimeter, but they're kind of, when they get to that level, they'll still do whatever they want. And when I, when I did mine, I would always cut off the bottom half inch of foundation to leave a gap there so that I could purposely allow them to, to raise drones. Um, sometimes that works, a lot of times they just leave an empty space. Yeah. I was a little confused. You said one of the reasons you, you go to the small cells because you want foundation. What do you mean by that? If you do foundationless, the bees are going to build, um, you hope they will build comb on the frames. They don't always. Sometimes they'll build a crossways or do something totally wacky or different. The other thing with foundation or without foundation is when bees are building comb, it will not be straight typically. It will typically be curved. And this is something that um, top bar beekeepers have to keep an eye on because if they start the hive and the colony in, in one end, the further they go along, the more curved the comb will be, kind of curved convex facing the cluster. And so they'll go in there pretty regularly and straighten it out or move bars around so they're trying to, trying to manipulate it to make straight comb. The other thing is if the hive is tipped ever so slightly, the bees will want to build vertical comb based on gravity. So if your hive is slightly tipped, your comb's not going to line up necessarily with the bottom bar that that's, it starts at on the top. So with foundation, like even if the hive's a little tipped, they'll build it on the foundation. And so that I don't have to go back in and check on it and make sure it's all straight. It just kind of happens. So that's what I mean. Yeah. How do you take a, a larger bee and regress it back to a small cell? The easiest way is to use the plastic frames from Man Lake because the, the bees will build the comb in the right size and the queen will lay new eggs in there and the, the bees that hatch out will be regressed down to the, the 4.9 cell size. Um, the other way to do it is with wax foundation and that's a little slower. You'll need a couple of generations of comb, replace the comb. The best way to do it is to, uh, to put fresh combs of foundation in the middle of the brood nest right before the main honey flow so that when they're building on that, they're building it quickly, they're building it as worker comb, they don't have time to mess around with it and think they might want to put honey in it or something like that. Again, that'll take a couple generations of comb or you can just go foundationless and over time as you replace combs, they will naturally reduce 
the, the cell size down to whatever tends to be natural in your area. Remember, anytime you're choosing a cell size, you're choosing a, a uh, you're choosing something that's been picked as an average or a, or a, what's a word that I'm thinking of? It starts with a C. Compromise. Compromise, there we go. Sometimes I just lose words. So for instance, a lot of things in our hive are compromises. B space is, you know, between a quarter to three eighths inch. That's, you know, you're going to find a compromise in there somewhere. Uh, combs are typically spaced at an inch and three eighths. That's a compromise between an inch and a quarter and an inch and a half for honeycomb. So every time we do things, we're kind of enforcing our will on the bee. So uh, foundationless, if, you, if you're interested in really natural as well as you can cell size with variation in cell size and, and free production of, of drone comb, then foundationless is what you want to go for. But that's higher maintenance, so you have to trade off. Yeah? The queens are not smaller because their their size is not based on their cell size. They're they they're raised in a really big cell, and their size is based on the amount of food they eat. So that won't change anything. A queen's abdomen is pretty flexible, so I've only heard of one or two queens in 15 years that I've been beekeeping that couldn't lay an egg in a small cell. Uh, so that's not typically a problem, and obviously would be self-correcting. Um, I think the drones might be slightly smaller, but drones are, are, there's a variation in sizes of drones already anyway. If you look at, at naturally uh, just drones made of, of from comb that the bees have built in a hive, you're going to see drones vary in size a little bit. So I'm, I'm not sure that we can put a solid number on that. All right, let's move to my method. Don't worry about this name, it's completely pointless. I just put it on there in case anybody wanted to copy me. I don't know. It's... I'm not worried about competition. There's another podcaster in here. I'm really not worried about competition. <laughs> uh, so what I do is called the Ben Hardin method, and you can find this method um, not on many places online. It's, it's kind of a less known method. I got it from Dave Cushman, who was, uh, I think he was English beekeeper when I started back in 2003. Uh, he's since passed away, but someone took over his website and has is, is maintained it in its original form. A lot of information, really, really uh, a good guy to, to find information about esoteric subjects. Um, so I think it's davecushman.net or something. But this is where I discovered his method. And so the, the basic way that it works is I prepare a queen right cell builder and that consists of a, all the brood that I can stuff in, in the bottom box, a 10 frame deep. And then in the second box, I cr created a, what, I, what are called blanks, which are two basically blocks of wood that sit in there. And they take up the space, so you're trying to concentrate the flow of bees through where you're going to have your queen cell. <coughs> it's not totally necessary but I think it helps make sure that there's a lot of bees right in there. You're getting your heat flow from the, the main nucleus of the hive below, and you're getting a lot of queen or royal jelly feeding those queens to make good quality queens. So then I uh, graft larvae into queen cups. I use wax queen cups. You can get them from Rossman, or you can actually now, I discovered that you can buy a little uh, silicone mold with in little indentations and you can pour wax and make your own wax queen cups. The reason why I liked wax, plastic works just fine, a lot of people use it. The reason why I liked wax is because when I'm done I can scrape it all off and melt it down and it's just wax, it's part of my thing. I don't have to worry about throwing away plastic or anything. And you know, wax, the bees do it with wax so why shouldn't I? Uh, I place the grafted larvae into the, the cell builder box above the queen excluder. Do I have a... I think I have... yeah, here we go. 
Um, I mismeasured mine, so I, my blanks ended up being a little narrower, so I have five frames. But hey, it's symmetrical, so that, that speaks to my OCD. Um, so basically the, the theory behind, oh, let me finish with, with the process. Uh, put the, the cell bar frame in there with the grafted queen cups. I'm gonna leave it in there for 10 days. You can again check the calendar for how exactly long. Um, if, it's, you've, if you have really warm weather, it might go a little quicker. If you have really cool weather, your queens might not hatch quite as quickly. It might take an extra day or two. Um, make sure to take them out before they hatch because the first one that hatches will kill all the rest and ruin your batch. And then she'll go down and try and kill your queen. So that's a thing to pay attention to also. Uh, then I take those individual queen cups, queen cells at this point, and I make up mating nukes, which I use the queen castles for. My, I built my own queen castles. They are three three-frame nukes per box. And so I use two frames of brood, one frame of honey. Um, you, for the design of those, you can th have the design on my website if you want to build your own. You can buy them also. I don't know of any ones that you can buy that are three, three frame deeps. Usually they do four two frame deeps or three three frame mediums. I don't know who has those available, but they're available. Um, so I put those, the brood and the queen cells in there. Uh, the queen hatches out. She goes out and flies around and mates with a bunch of drones, comes back. About a week or so, she's laying eggs, hopefully. I like to leave her in there for um, 40 days from the day that she was laid, at least, so she, she develops her ovaries and everything well. Um, I don't typically cage queens, because I haven't, I haven't sold any through the mail yet. I plan on it, I would like to. Um, but from there, I will generally, um, there'll be a couple of failures. You know, everybody, and I've discovered, it seems like every area has a different return rate on their mating queens. Uh, when I was in Arkansas, the rate seemed to be around 80, 85%. Uh, I've been told that in Wisconsin, it's more like 70, 75%. It might be different here. Depends on birds that like to eat bees, or it might get caught by the hornets that I discovered that you guys have. Uh, we don't have European hornets out where I am, so that's nice. Or dragonflies will catch queens also. Sometimes queens won't come back. Um, so you'll have a couple of, of those mating nukes that don't have queens in them. And so you can combine those with the ones that do, and that will give you a five frame nuke. And from there, you can let it grow a little bit, you can sell it, you can keep it for yourself. What I like to do is, um, usually there's gonna be, I don't know, between the, the queen process and the nuke process, you're gonna have a third that aren't great. You have a third that are pretty good. You have a third that may be really good. So you wanna keep the really good ones for yourself. And if you're gonna sell anything, sell the, the mediocre ones. And don't sell anything that you don't wanna back up. Like, you know, don't be that guy. And then from there, um, if, or the other thing that I would do is people would come buy queens, so I'd go out to one of my five frame nukes, take the queen out, cage her and give, sell them to them, and then I take that five frame nuke and combine it with another five frame nuke, and now I have a 10 frame hive. And do that a couple more times, and now I have a 20 frame hive, and so in that process I can pretty rapidly build hives that are ready to go in the winter on my best queens, and the queens that I want to sell get sold. Yeah. Do you use uh, any cages once I cap the queen? I have used, I have used cell, what are they called, guards, little orange things that you kind of put around the queen cell and that, that keeps the workers from chewing them in from the side. That's not totally necessary. And it also, because they have a little fork thing, you can use that to stick it into the comb and hold it while you're assembling the, the mating nuke, so that helps. But I haven't used like the the roller cages, the hair roller cages, yeah. Yeah. Okay, this just got hard. Uh, could, you, could you explain your box again? Where you say queen, is that, that has 10 frames, and there are nurse bees, and regular larvae, and brood, and the entrance is there, and people can go in and out. The second level, they can't go in and out, but the bees can go up through to feed the larvae that's there. Correct. And there will be, you can see the the, 
the distribution of young brood and such up in there. I like to do, because mine have five frames, I will do um, one frame of brood on either side of the cell bar frame so that I'm making sure to get plenty of nurse bees in there with the queens. But and you feed them up there even though the queen is down below and they know there's a queen in the hive? Yes. And I'll talk about the reason for that in a moment, I think. No, I won't. No, I will. <laughs> the reason why I believe that happens, first of all, the, the nurse bees are going to continue to, to feed the larvae no matter if there's a queen present or not. They're going to continue to do their job. One of the problems we get is when we try and, try and put human emotions and, and motivations on bees when they don't have those. And so um, we don't think the way they do. And so just to get into the mindset of the bee, when we begin a task, you know, we usually have a plan. We, we start the thing, we finish the thing, hopefully, if you're, unless you're a procrastinator like me and you may not finish. Um, and you, you carry it to completion. But because bees are so short-lived and with limited processing capability, they tend to, to finish jobs somebody else started. Okay? Um, so in the case of building queens, the reason why this works, the reason why you can get them to make a new queen when they already have a queen, is because they come upon a queen cell that's got a queen larvae in it, and it kind of looks like a queen cell, and they think, oh, there must be a queen cell. Um, they don't think, but we're working with thinking about other people's minds here. Um, And the, the other important thing is that the queen never touches the cell bar frame because she leaves pheromones all over the place. And if she gets on there and leaves her pheromones on there, they won't build those queens because they, they don't think they're necessary. Because in a normal hive, they're, a lot of times they're building queen cups in case they need them, and then they tear them down. Some hives will do it more that you see it more often. They'll think, oh, my hive's going to swarm, but there's no egg in there. They're not worried about it. They're just building it. They may tear it down. They may decide to swarm later, don't know. Um, so in this case, what we're kind of tricking them into doing is, see, here's a queen cup. I don't smell the queen. We must be superseding the queen. So I'm going to continue working on this queen cup. And that's kind of how we're doing it. The reason why we like to do this on a, oh, by the way, this, was, this method was created as a way to produce royal jelly. So what they would do is they would graft these queen cups, they'd let the, let the workers fill them with royal jelly, they'd come in, scoop out all the royal jelly, and then redo the process. And so you can, you can produce royal jelly for medicinal purposes that way. The reason why I like this method for us backyard beekeepers is you can take this one hive and without messing up its honey production, you can raise queens on it. And then when you're done raising the queens, Maybe you even can use that brood from that bottom box and make nukes with that. So you can take one hive and make... If, you're, if, if, if there's 10 frames of brood in the bottom, you could make a good five nukes out of it. Um, or if you have another hive, you, could, you can make more. It, it's really the, the limiting factor with this method is the amount of brood you have available. Okay? Um, the other thing, the difficult part with Look how old that is. There's, see, 14,000 14, members? We now have 26,000 members, so. Anyway, the difficult part with using a queenless hive in, in making queen cells is that a queenless hive is, by its very nature, volatile. They don't have the moderating Im impact of the queen's presence, her scent and pheromones in the hive, and so, What's happened to me when I've tried dumping a bunch of um, bees into a nuke to make a, a queen cell builder is sometimes they'll swarm on me. They'll just all disappear. And I come back a day later and there's no bees in this thing that's supposed to be making my queens. But you'll never have that happen with a queen right hive because the hive is in full operation and you're not really um, messing that up. So that's, that's why I think this method works especially well for backyard beekeepers.
And again, you don't have to use it. It's up to you. It's just I'm, I'm offering it to you as a method that I think will work well. Could you back up that one slide? Sure. Oh, yeah. You said this is on your website, too, though? This is on my website on, on parkerbees.com. And you can also find this at um, uh, Michael, what was it? Not Michael. Dave Cushman. Dave Cushman. And if you're still using that for honey production at the same time because of the blanks and some other things, would you leave a, a second or third or some entrances up top in the honey super? Yeah, you can definitely do that. It, you can operate it like a normal hive. Uh, if, you're combine, if you're confining the queen to just 10 frames of brood, um, you might want to switch some of those out up to the top and back and forth once in a while so that she doesn't run out of spots to lay, especially if you're in your, your high production season, she might get everything filled up in the bottom. So that's something to keep track of. You could put it on top of the second Correct. box you, and then do the third one as the, the production site? Correct. Okay. So you can Let's go with you first. So you're not using a cell starter in this, you're actually putting just your grafted eggs on your bar and sticking in here. Directly in here. That's correct. Do everything on your own. Correct. Everything's queen right in this method. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about the grafting process, like uh, what you use to get the larva out, and do you spray it with royal jelly, and if so, where you get it? How do you keep it in when it's hanging upside down? Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's start with constructing a cell bar frame. You can use a normal frame. Uh, just use like a, it would be a three-quarter inch wide by maybe three-eighths inch thick stick that fits in there. and. And the way I do it with the wax cups is I get a little candle going or something, take the wax cup, stick it over there, melt it, and stick it onto the bar. If you want to buy your, you can buy pre-made cell bar frames in both medium and deep sizes. Those are handy because uh, they, they help you space things well. Otherwise, you can just take that cell bar frame and, and you can stick it in there with wax or you can put some twist ties on it or something just so it's hanging in there. And the, the good thing about the, the pre-made ones is you can, you know, a deep frame will hold three cell bars, a medium frame will hold two cell bars. And you, they need to be spaced apart enough so that they have enough room to build that queen cell in there and still be able to get around it. All right, so we've stuck, we've stuck the cups to the bar. Um, if you use wax, or if you use plastic ones, they have a little thing that you can stick into the groove in a pre-made bar. Uh, and so then I'm going to go to the grafting part. I, uh, after the break, I'll pull up the video of the, the girl grafting. You can see kind of how the process goes. Um, so I mean grafting. So the way I like to do it is I have, a, I have a hatchback car. I have a Nissan Leaf. And I sit on the tailgate in the car with the door up. And there's a, there's a little ledge there that you're, I don't know, kids are supposed to throw their toys on or whatever. And I put my frame right there. I wear a headlamp because, you know, I'm in the shade. I want to keep the, want to keep the larvae out of the sun because the sun, the, the UV rays can kill them pretty quick. And so I'm in there working. A lot of times what I'll do when I go in to set up the, the cell starter in there is I'll put a, a frame of empty comb in the brood nest. And then four days later, I'll come back and usually the queen will lay a, a fresh empty comb. She will lay that full of eggs the first day she gets a hold of it. And so when you come back, you'll have all the larvae of the right age and you can graft them. If not, you'll have to go and look through the brood and find the youngest brood that you can find and, and do it manually that way. So I'll sit in there and I'll have my headlamp and I'll have like a moist towel that I will lay over the cell bar frame so that it doesn't dry out. Um, and I will graft using a, you, with as far as what tool to use, find whatever tool you like to use. It really doesn't matter. I've heard of guys using a, um, a paper clip with a flattened end. You can make your own. One of the easiest ones to do it with in my view is the bamboo tool, which you can get for just a couple of dollars from any beekeeping supplier. Get a couple of them. The quality is not always great, so if you have a couple of them, you can, whichever one works best. So you graft, the, you, you 
pick the right age larva, you're going to scoop them out, you're going to go deposit them in the cups. You don't want to flip them over. Each, each larva is going to be in the shape of a C. If you flip them over, they'll drown. So you want to pick them up as they are and then set them back down as they are. You can pre-prime the, I guess that's redundant, you can prime the cell cups with a little dab of royal jelly with your, your hive tool if you want, it's not required. But that'll help you maybe lubricate the process. And then once you've filled all the, the cell bars up, um, I like to keep them covered with a moist towel just so they don't dry out. They probably won't anyway, but depending on your conditions. Um, and then I'll go put that into my cell builder. Is there anything that... And they stick? It sticks inside the cup even though it's upside down? Yes, they stick. Okay, and the nurse bees will walk right up there and feed them because they're there? Yes. Also remember we're putting, we're putting young brood in there as well. And so anytime there's young brood anywhere, bees will move on to it within half an hour. They, they, you know, it's a scent, they're following a scent, they're doing their job. There's another nuke method, is, am I, did I explain what you needed to hear there? Uh, while we're on the break, I'll find the YouTube video that shows somebody kind of doing the process. It's really, it's hard to explain because it's, you know, this little tiny delicate work, but once you see someone doing it, it's like, oh, that's it. It's really not that complex. Um, any, any other questions about that before I go on? Yeah. I've heard someone also say with the, the plastic foundation, it's easier to graft because you can just scrape right down to the plastic. Yes. And you can take the whole cell, and the, the, you know, the wax and everything, and put it in the cup. Does it work, or do you not use? Uh, it would probably work. I don't. I don't know if I've ever done it that way. Um, yeah, but often they'll use black plastic frames because it's easier to see the larva. If you, with a with wax foundation or with foundationless, if you're trying to scoop a larva out of there and it's fairly fresh wax and doesn't have a buildup of cocoons in the bottom, you can poke right through the bottom. Which, again, they're just baby little larva bees. If you mess one up, just get another one. There's thousands. <laughs> in fact, if you want to learn how to do it and don't even want to graft, you can practice scooping them around and putting them in places. It really, <coughs> there's so many bees in a hive, they're basically individually expendable. So yeah. we had a, like, at one point this summer after a hive swarm, we had uh, a whole bunch of supersedure cells in that hive. I guess you could go ahead and seed all them with larvae if you wanted to. You could, yeah. Just for fun. Just for fun, yeah. And there's, there's a bunch of other methods of making queens. You can find a, a good s a selection of them on Michael Bush's website. Uh, there's literally dozens. I'm just talking about a couple here that are easy to do in your backyard. Other ones involve building extra equipment and, and doing extra management techniques, but I don't have time to go through all of them today. You said this was originally the, the Ben Hardman method? Ben Harden, H-A-R-D-E-N. He's, uh, I believe he's still alive. He's quite elderly at this point. And that's the same thing as the peak method, you called it? And it's the same thing we're still talking about? Yeah. Right. Peep method, you don't need to remember that. That's really not relevant. <laughs> Parker efficient expansion process. You don't have to. <laughs> I literally never use that. <laughs> I just say the Ben Harden method because if you, if you go looking for it, that's what you'll be able to find. You have to make marshmallow bees and have instructions on the back of the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, peeps, I guess that makes sense. Do they make peeps here? Where they started. Oh, cool. Awesome. I actually learned a new nuke method last weekend that I'm going to share with you right now. I don't have it in my, my slideshow yet, but I probably will next time. Um, this is one that I got from Larry, was it O'Connor's his last name? Connor. Connor? Okay, yeah. Yes, that's him, Larry Connor. That Larry Connor? Okay, I gotta get his name. I'm be terrible with names. If I ask you what your name is after you've already told me, don't take offense. It's just, just me. Anyway, his method of making nukes is he has a little adapter that sits on top of a hive, 
and it's a it's a 10 frame to 5 frame so basically you could make one just by taking a piece of plywood the size of a hive and cutting a hole in it and I have. It's easy. yeah cut a hole in it and put a queen excluder on it attach it or you can just set a queen excluder under it you take um, frames of brood out you can either shake them in front of the hive or you can shake them in, in the hive, however you want to do it. Uh, he likes to do it in front of the hive because apparently he's efficient like me. And uh, anyway, he, the queen will, will crawl back in. And so anyway, you, he'll have empty frames of brood. Um, you set those aside for a moment. You put the adapter and a five frame nuke on top. And you don't necessarily have to use a five frame nuke. It's just convenient for a smaller box. They don't have to so they can keep it warm. Put five frames of brood in that box with a queen cage or a queen cell or whatever you got. And then put that back on the top of the hive. <coughs> put a lid on it so it's all closed up. And then within in about two hours later, you come back, take that nuke off, put a lid and a bottom on it, and you now have a nuke. What'll happen in that two hours is all the nurse bees will come crawling back up through the queen excluder to take care of their brood. Mm -hmm. And now you'll have a hive that's full of nurse bees that will be much more accepting of your new queen. So you have a, a almost foolproof method of making a nuke without having to find the queen, without having to, to worry about a bunch of other things. Any questions about that? And this is when you're introducing a new queen or queen cells? Yeah, if you have either a queen or queen cells um, to work with, say you bought, you made, made your own or you bought some or, or whatever, you, whatever you're doing, that's a quick and easy way to make a nuke. They will re readily accept a new queen and you don't have to worry about doing a split. You don't have to worry about finding the queen or getting the right aged bees or whatever. And those bees, since they've never been out of the hive before, they don't know where they are flying around. You, you don't have to worry about the, the forager bees flying back to the original hive. All the bees that are in there will stay in there. And I, I, and I did it from, um, somebody told me the method, so I tried it, and I actually cut it for the five frame nuke, but I used a, an eight frame um, medium and pulled some young brood from three different hives and put five frames of brood in there and then two frames of some pollen and some honey and then just stuck it on there, you know, to let the nurse bees come up and then sat it right next to the other three hives so that they raised up their own queen. So it was a kind of a walk away split, a hybrid, yeah. where they did, you know, raise their own queen out of it from just the, the, the young larvae. Yeah, you can do it that way too. But then everything, there was no bees, you know, no foraging bees to, to move around. And so when they hatched out, it was right next to the other three and everybody just stayed intact. Right. And those bees will eventually become forager bees anyway, so you don't have to worry about that. But there was plenty of nurse bees up in there within the, you know, really an hour. Yeah, they do it pretty quickly because they, they need to maintain the temperature and humidity on that brood so that it doesn't die. So they get up there pretty quick. Yeah. If you're introducing a new queen, say a cage queen, to something like that, do you think you'd still need that slow release or you think you could readily just release her? Um, I have introduced virgin queens into hives just by smoking them real good and then just drop her in and have no problems. Um, but with a, with a pre-mated queen, you probably want to introduce her slowly. He, Larry talks about introducing virgins and, and she can remain queen, uh, caged for up to, he recommends not more than five days and she'll still go out and, and mate. But, but a virgin queen is pretty much welcome in any hive. So you don't have to worry too much about getting her acclimated.